Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Ken Levine. I'm one of the docents here at the San Luis Obispo Botanical Garden. Um, I'll give you a little history, I think, first of the garden. Uh, this whole idea was one woman's idea. She was a returned student to Cal Poly in horticulture. She'd graduated from UC Berkeley, I believe, in languages or something years before. But her children were the age where she could go back to school and uh, she was interested in horticulture. And as a senior, she was working on a project at Vandenberg Air Force Base in <clears throat> redoing a whole area with plants that would be more sustainable. And in doing that, she realized that these plants she was working with were plants from Mediterranean climates. And um, she had to go all over the state trying to get the information. This was in the mid 80s. And it wasn't, although we knew we needed water in California, even then, it wasn't quite as critical. And so when she got all done, she told her advisor, there should be a botanical garden in California, which just shows plants from the areas of the world that have our same climate, our Mediterranean climate. And he said, well, that's a good idea, Eve. Her name is Eve Vigil. Uh, why don't you do that? And she did. Hmm. She got some people together and uh, worked out an idea and um, incorporated it as a nonprofit in 1991. And that's when my wife and I saw, heard about it, and joined. So I've been involved since 1991. That's and, awesome. And uh, I've always wanted to be a docent in a botanical garden, so we have a botanical garden to be a docent in. Okay, what's a Mediterranean climate? <clears throat> um, I'm going to show you a map, but first off is the real definition is it's a climate that's temperate and all of the rain comes at one time of the year and that's what really makes it different um, than other areas um, <clears throat> that have the, in the world. So let's look at a map. If you look at this map, the things that are in gold or orange are the Mediterranean climate. So we've got California, parts of Chile, most of the Mediterranean basin, a couple of areas in Australia, and a little area in South Africa. Basically, that's no more than 2% of the total Earth is Mediterranean climate, and probably 10% of all the plants live in that 2%. So if we say which is most, 60% is in the Mediterranean basin, 10% in California, 5% in Chile, 3% if South Africa is here, just the very western Cape is the only part that's Mediterranean in South Africa, and two areas in Australia around Adelaide and around Perth. And looking at that map, if you see, you can see they all fall within 30 and 45 latitude, whether it's in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere. And the other thing to look at is that they all face west. There are none on any eastern parts of a continent. And that's because of the air currents and ocean currents. And you get high pressure for a big part of the year off those coasts. And so the rain can't come in. Um, so what do plants that live in a Mediterranean climate have to do to survive? What do they have problems with? Well, they have problems with long periods of drought and fire. And so we're going to talk a lot about adaptation to those, those two situations. Um, and how does adaptation take place? Well, there's three basic ways. You can have slight variations in a plant where one of the variations is beneficial in a drier climate. And so it becomes more of the population as, because it survives better. You could have a mutation, a total change in that would be a, a, a good adaptation, or two plants hybridizing and producing a new plant that is again um, more easily able to survive within those situations. So <clears throat> that's what adaptation really is. Uh, and it, in nature, if an adaptation is beneficial, it will probably survive. Now there are some adaptations that are not beneficial to a plant, but man can also adapt plants. And a good example is uh, early on in a Mediterranean climate area, in the, down, right down here in the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates uh, rivers, 
they decided that there was this grass that was good as far as making flour, except that what's typical of grasses is that their seeds tend to fall at different times of the year scattered, which is a way of surviving because they want to be there when the rains come and so they lose a few leaves at a, seeds at a time. But man noticed that they could keep finding ones where the seeds held on longer and they selected and selected until they had wheat that they could harvest all at once and make a practical purpose. So that's, adaptations can work both ways. Okay, let's see if there's anything else we want to say about this. Well, because of that, we're going to walk around and we're going to see plants from the five areas uh, that we're talking about. And they all have some similarities. The reason they have similarities isn't because they're necessarily related. It's just that by adaptation, they have come to look alike. And um, so we'll see uh, trees that are uh, similar and have some of those characteristics. So let's start and we're going to talk about succulents. Okay. What's a succulent? Well, it isn't that they're all a family or the same genus or the same species or anything. They're all, they're unrelated plants. The aloe family, the daisy family, the crassula family, the euphorbia family. What makes them all succulents is they have the ability to store excess water in their leaves, their stems, or in their roots. And of course, what we're gonna be looking at mostly today as we walk around, maybe some stems, but mostly leaves. And probably, we can talk about roots, but we probably won't see any. Um, so here's a good example of a plant and how much water a little succulent can store. And I'm gonna squeeze this, and I don't know if this is gonna show. But there is water dripping out of those. Yes. And as you know, if I took an oak leaf, I couldn't squeeze water out of it, even though there is water in there. So that's one adaptation. The other one is, that on this same plant, it, we, if we look at the color of it, and this is common in a lot of plants in a Mediterranean climate, it looks sort of bluish or light colored. Uh, light colored leaves reflect sun, so they stay cooler. But this one, and it probably won't show, but if I, if you look, it looks sort of bluish. Now, I'll wipe that off. And now it looks greener because that's a wax that I just wiped off that it produces as a sunscreen. While we're standing here, I think we'll talk about a really, it's a good time to talk about uh, photosynthesis in plants. Um, if I took a, one of these oak leaves that are right here in front of me and I, we had a big, a good, good magnifying glass, we could look underneath the surface and see stomata, which is a mouth. So sim singular would be stoma. And when we say stomatitis, that means we got an inflammation in our mouth. So it's the same thing. Those little pores are where water and um, oxygen come out and carbon dioxide is taken into the plant for photosynthesis. So a lot of plants can do save water by closing those at night, if it's a hot, dry night, because they're not gonna do, do photosynthesis anyway then. And so that just cuts down evaporation of water from the, from the leaves. But another group, and this is a crassula here, and commonly called a jade plant, but there's a whole process that's named after this family. And the process is called crassulacean acid metabolism. So it's a very clever thing. Yes, they could close their stoma at night, but they still would have to do photosynthesis in the day time, and they're gonna have to open their stoma then if they weren't 
didn't have this special process and that's when it's hot but that's when the sun's out and that's what you need it's carbon dioxide and the sunlight and chlorophyll to produce sugar so what they do they take they open up at night they open up and they take in carbon dioxide and chemically store it within the leaves then in the daytime they close the stoma but the sun's out and they release that carbon dioxide and do photosynthesis so that's a very amazing i think technique that has developed in this family but also some other plants that aren't in that family so they they never open their stomata during the day no they if it's hot if it's hot i'm okay. sure just if it's if, hot it, it, okay. yeah I, it's i don't think they do that if they don't have to but it, it is a way that they can continue to do photosynthesis even in really hot weather as long as i guess if the nights were too hot they might, <laughs> might not do it either but mm. it's usually cooler yeah okay well, let's, let's go on and we're just going to start looking at different plants and see how is this an adaptation. Here's our coast live oak. If you, yeah, if you touch that leaf, it's tough. That's called sclerophyll. That toughness also helps prevent wilting and loss of water but on that leaf also and you can see it there it curves down around the edge and that's just a windbreak because the stoma are underneath and if a breeze comes by and it causes evaporation but if it's bent down you're going to break up that breeze a little bit and so curving down at the edges um, is one adaptation the other is that they have this very tough cuticle and that just reduces evaporation? Evaporation, and it, it prevents it from, the leaf from getting quite as hot. Mm. But it is a dark green leaf, so it's, it's not like the nice pale leaves that don't get as hot. It's still going to, it's not going to uh, reflect light as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, I like this plant. First of all, because I like this plant. It's a very pretty plant. It's one of the many manzanita species in California. And uh, between the hot weather... Yep, yeah, I'm looking for a berry. No. There was one there. It dropped right off. Oh, it... I found one. Good. Not looking so good. No. <laughs> Yeah, but you can see it looks like a little apple. That's where the plant gets its name. Manzana is apple in Spanish, and this is a little apple, so it's manzanita. But there's a lot of different manzanitas in California. This is one from Sonoma County, but it um, has a characteristic that is definitely an adaptation to um, Mediterranean climate and trying to have the leaves stay cooler so that you get less evaporation, less loss of water. Um, can you see that? Can you see anything about the leaves that would be different? Now, if you were in a tropical rainforest, you'd be seeing plants with big leaves in this direction, trying to get as much sun as they can. Dark green and big. But in Mediterranean climates and, of course, deserts, little leaves are beneficial. And also, this adaptation. The, the leaves are like this. So the hottest time of the day, when at noon, they're not getting hit at just the edge of the leaves. In the morning and the evening is when they're picking up the sunlight to do photosynthesis. So it is, it, it's a, another adaptation to keep them, the leaves cooler. So we'll go on here. And is that one endemic only to the Sonoma region? No, this one is this endemic one is? only to Sonoma only region. To, okay. But it grows <laughs> well. It's been here. This is one of our, I think, very close to original plantings. Okay. So it would be very close to 1996. Wait, I'll tell you exactly because I can find this session. <laughs> 1996, 153. So it was the 153rd plant oh, cool. that we planted in 1996. Oh, that's awesome. So it's right up there at the top as far as older plants. Yeah. Um, huh. What 
that was was an accessioning label. And that's a good thing to talk about. A botanical garden can't even call itself a botanical garden unless it has records of all the plants. And what we have is a database that if we went to 156 or 1996, 150, whatever that was, um, either name or number, then we find all we know about this plant. Mm. When, when it was planted, where we got it from, um, uh, where it's no native to, just as much information as we can for every plant in the garden. Now, sometimes we'll have a bed of a lot of little plants and we might, they might all have the same accessioning number and they're usually annuals or short-lived plants. But okay. if a thing is gonna be a plant of any size, it has its own number, even mm. if there were three of them in a row. Cool. Okay. Now, if you were here, really here, you could smell this and you'd all know what it was. It's rosemary. It's a member of the sage family. Uh, most of the sage family have fragrance to the leaves and the flowers, for that matter. But, you, okay, so, of course, rosemary, we use it in cooking. It's interesting because a lot of the herbs that are sage family we use in cooking, and yet herbivores like deer, that's one of the last things they'll eat. They don't seem to like it. Um, but what's the benefit as far as of this, as far as um, being in a Mediterranean climate? Because a lot of sage family do live in Mediterranean climates. Well, what we're smelling is a volatile organic compound that makes that smell. Um, when we're talking in the building later, we'll talk about not wanting any volatile organic compounds in the paints or in the, uh, any of the materials, fabrics or anything like that, because they can't, some of them can be unhealthy, but we, these aren't. But how does that work, help? Well, if you're walking in foothills here and um, come to, uh, California sagebrush, which is Artemisia californica, uh, you, you're walking, and especially if you step on it or anything, you can really smell it. It's the sagey smell, even though it isn't a sage. And that's because it's warm, and these volatile organic compounds vaporize the warmer it is. They're not a true oil, but they're like an oil, and they tend to act to hold water in and not allow the water to be lost mm -hmm. out, out by evaporation. So mostly plants don't want to lose water by evaporation, but sometimes, and try to see, we'll wait till we get to a plant that I can demonstrate it on. Okay, I'm looking at this plant here. This is a Flomus. It's native to the Mediterranean basin, particularly around the Adriatic Sea. And it demonstrates, and not real well right now, but I think I can show some, um, a thing called seasonal dimorphism. So that means it takes two different shapes at different seasons. So if it had been raining, A stem that came up during when it was wet, the leaves would be bigger. And I think that some of these would be bigger than if we look at some of these. Um, but since we've had really dry weather for now for quite a while, I can't show you any really big ones. But typically, after the winter, we'll have some, some big leaves and then a lot of the small leaves that are still from the year before. <laughs> But that makes sense that if you make smaller leaves, you're not going to lose as much water and you still got plenty of sunlight. Okay. These are, we'd call small, narrow, or almost needle-like leaves. And they have another way, this, this is another thing that can be beneficial to a plant in trying to conserve water. Um, there's a, a boundary area around leaves, um, which is an area of 
not moving air, uh, quiet area. And the, the way it works is that in smaller leaves, that, that boundary area is thinner than on a big leaf. So that actually you get heat, conduct can, can be conducted away or by convection, it can get away from the leaf easier. However, in doing that, the, with conduction, part of that loss is actually evaporation. So sometimes that helps keep cool. I mean, our dogs definitely keep cool by panting and that's totally evaporation. We sweat and, and by evaporation of sweat, we stay cooler. So that does work um, as long as, it, and it helps on a small needle like leaf. There would be another plant back in there, mm -hmm. Calathamnus, that has those needle-like leaves. That's an Australian plant. It's related to bottle brush trees. Hmm. Right? <laughs> Here's a good example of another succulent that produces a waxy material, and I think I can show you. I'll wipe my hand there. Oh, wow. You can see it, and there you can see what I just... Yeah. So that plant is producing its own sunscreen. I think I'll talk about the fig tree, because right. when we look at a fig tree, one thing that hits us is this is a Mediterranean climate plant and it's got big dark green leaves um, and that's a good thought. Why would a plant that we connect with the Mediterranean, as far as we know, it began in the eastern Mediterranean and then was cultivated all over the Mediterranean since before biblical times probably. And, um, one of the things that uh, uh, was told to me was that all figs, except the edible fig, are tropical plants. Every, there's many, many ficuses, rubber tree plants, all these different plants, they're all tropical. And that probably this is a tropical plant initially that has been able somehow to adapt to the Mediterranean, but it is the one and of course, there's other edible figs that people don't eat, but lots of animals eat figs all over the world. But uh, this is a good one. This one is the oldest tree by far in our garden because the original tree was brought up to the mission garden from the San Gabriel mission back in like 1787, I think. And uh, so we're talking, 18, 19, well over 200 years ago. Huh. And it was in the mission garden, and then it was in a nursery when that garden, when the mission sold off the land. And there was a nursery there that I can remember when we moved up here in 1962. And then later that was sold and it was developed for apartments. And the tree, the fig tree was supposed to be remained and there was a bond on the contractor that he would build around the fig tree because it was called the mother fig. Um, and somehow it got knocked down with a bulldozer and people took cuttings. And so there's several of these growing at the Della de Adobe, there were cuttings from that fig. And a woman had taken a cutting and put it in a wine barrel and then she donated it to our garden. Mm -hmm. So this is not a seedling, this is the same tree. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, it's well over 200 years old. How and big? How big was that tree when they knocked it down? It Do was you? really big. Yeah, <laughs> huge tree. Mm -hmm. huh? These things get gigantic. Yeah, figs, and, and this one has good figs. You got a good crop this year. Yeah, this is... it's, yeah, it's really good. This, I, I think this is the second crop which figs do that, but the first crop was not near as big as this. Mm -hmm. But th it may be our weather. When they get black, if the birds haven't already eaten them, we can get them. Can talk about these signs maybe just a little bit too, because sure. students are yeah. interested in that. Right, and this sign is actually about this plant here, Erica cruenta. Um, 
the Erica's is a big family. Uh, um, what do I call it? Heather and Heath and mm -hmm. England. So it, it spread all over the world. There's a lot of things in this family in, in Australia too. But South Africa has Ron Kindig, who makes these signs, found 740 species of Erica's. Just in South Africa? Yeah. Holy I that, I think that's where it is because it's, I know it's hundreds and hundreds. Huh. Um, and that's an interesting thing. Why does a little tiny, when we talk about the Mediterranean climate area of South Africa, and it's only 3% of the Mediterranean climate for the whole world, probably, and we're 10% in California, it probably has many more species of plants than California. And mm -hmm. California has more than any other state in the United States. Mm -hmm. Big or small. Mm -hmm. um, so, why does it have so many? And the theory is that if you look at California, we have two ranges of mountains, the coast and the Sierras, and they run parallel or relatively parallel north to south. Uh, if we look at Chile, they've got a coastal range and the Andes. At the, towards the south, the Andes are almost in the ocean, but for quite a bit of it, they have that same thing with big central valleys and then the mountains. In, in California, the Mediterranean climate goes up to 2,000 feet in the Sierras. In Chile, because the Andes are closer to the ocean, it goes up to 5,000 feet hmm. because the ocean has tremendous thermal mass and keeps it temperate. So um, you can have Mediterranean climate much higher altitude, but because it has the same temperature and humidity that we would have in a lower altitude hmm. but South Africa and and again in in Europe you've got the Alps running up and down in Italy and across up the Europe they've got the Pyrenees South Africa has little mountain ranges crisscrossing so it's more like a checkerboard hmm. and when the Ice Age came it didn't wasn't as bad in the southern hemisphere but it did go down in the southern hemisphere and it did go up in these mountains so that they were all the valleys were separated mm. for a long period of time and it's thought that maybe that's when they had all these different species developing and they were separated and then it, it uh, it caused them to have so many things in such a small area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. But it, it, that's a theory. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, but this plant has a really neat adaptation, which I won't be able to show you, but I can tell you about. <laughs> Here's a leaf. Well, we've got a small leaf. That alone has advantages. What you can't see is if we had that oak leaf, and they curl down to help protect the stoma. This has two edges that curl down mm. and came all the way around to the central vein. Mm. If we cut this in cross section, across it, and then looked at it with a magnifying glass or under a microscope, we would see two tunnels. Mm. Because they've come around, they haven't attached, but it comes right up to the central vein. So it's made two little tunnels that are open at the end and at the back. The only way air current blows through there is with difficulty. Yes. <laughs> so um, it's not going to lose as much water, but it still can put out gas and take in oxygen. So do they have to have adaptations? And carbon dioxide and put out. Yeah, yeah. Do they have to have adaptations? Apply for uh, reduced amounts of gas that can exchange. I mean, no, I don't think so. No, there's still they've plenty. got so many leaves. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> so lots of small leaves is a, another way. Why the fig has <laughs> big leaves is a, just a good question yeah, because yeah. it truly is a Mediterranean plant. Yeah. Okay. So folks could use these signs to to help them figure out you know Definitely. what but, the signs and. A few, there's a good example. We have QR codes on some of the plants. And with a cell phone, that'll take you to our website, which is slobg, that's San Luis Obispo Botanical Garden, dot org. You can go to that without the sign of this and look up any of the plants that are in our garden. And it's a really nice website now. And 
and find out all the information we know about it. Uh, we have a book that's 128 of uh, our best that Ron Kindig, who makes the signs, has put out together. Mm -hmm. And it's ones that have done well over the years in our garden. So it's really applicable probably to the whole county, except it's more applicable to right here sure. <laughs> than anywhere because sure. certainly our northern part of our county has a different Mediterranean climate. That, and that's something we didn't talk about, but let's talk about Crescent City is a Mediterranean climate. The down past Ensenada in Baja is a Mediterranean climate. But we're talking about 30 or 40 or 70 inches of rain mm -hmm. up north and maybe three inches at the south. So it isn't the amount of rain but the fact that the only time mm. of year is um, wet, what we call the winter or the wet season, yeah. that, they, that any of that comes. So they all have to do with six, seven months of, of drought. This is a plant. If you get over to the garden, and you should come, and at different times of the year it's different, but I get a chance to touch these leaves. Yeah, I actually touch one of the ones that's not fresh. Yeah. It's really hard. Oh my gosh. This is the hardest leaf you'll ever feel. This is a really sclerophyll leaf. Feels like plastic. Yes, it feels that's what everyone says. It feels like plastic. It doesn't feel like a living thing. And and Dr. Matt Ritter, the botanist at Cal Poly, told me he read a thing. One leaf on this plant can live for 17 years. Wow. That's really something. And he said it must take so much energy to produce a leaf like this, they can't afford to lose it. But it's so tough that it won't wilt. And if, of course, if a leaf wilts, it bends down, it cuts off circulation, and it, that, that's not good. And it it's, protects against water loss because it is so tough. And herbivores probably aren't going to try and eat it. They're not going to eat it, no. <laughs> um, it's mostly pollinated in Australia by little tiny marsupial about the size of a mouse that are nectar eaters. Mm. So they go up to the flower, and I don't think we have any fresh flowers on it. Um, I could show you a dried up flower from last year. Oh wow, yeah. It, which was pinkish yellow, kind of a funny pinkish tan. Um, and we did have one flower on here, one time, produce a seed. So it means it was pollinated. Hmm. Birds can pollinate it too. Birds don't generally like to get down that low <laughs> if they can help it, but they do. And in Australia, it's bird pollinated also, but it's primarily a little, little tiny marsupial. Huh. Oh, all right, my favorite tree. <laughs> okay. Again, if you come over to the garden, you're welcome to, this is an area we don't have anything planted in it. You can walk in and you can push on this bark, on this tree. And this is a cork oak. And when you do that, you can feel it's spongy. You can actually push your thumb into it, especially the whitest part there. So this is where we get corks. Uh, which is, and, and this bark is an adaptation, but we'll talk about that. We'll show you first kind of how corks are made. There's a picture of just cutting off the bark. This is the dead bark that's going to be cut off so it doesn't harm the tree. And under good conditions, it'll be replaced in about nine years. And then oh, down at the bottom of that next page is how it looks when they stack that all up. It looks like big tiles, roof tiles stacked on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So that, after they take it off, they dry it in stacks. And then they take it out and soak it to try and get as much of the tannin which is bitter and would not be good if it went into wine. And they get as much of the tannin out as they can, and then they flatten them after they've been soaked. So now you have a piece of cork oak bark, but it doesn't look like this at all. Mm -hmm. 
This has been, this is cork oak bark that has been removed. This would be the third time it was removed. So if we remove this, it, you really couldn't make corks out of it. You could grind it up and make um, cork boards or mm -hmm. things like that, but you couldn't make corks out of it. The next time, which is usually under good conditions, about nine years later, you can take it off again. It would still not look like this, but it would be closer. The third time it's removed, another nine years, so we're talking about 18 years there after it's about 25 years old initially before you can even start doing it. So wow. about 43 years after you plant them, you can start making corks. Wow. And so to make the corks, they just if we want a two inch cork, you slice it two inches off and then they have a machine that just <laughs> punches them out. That's so cool. So that's how we get corks. Now, what I think is interesting is all corks that are used commercially come from the Mediterranean basin and 80% of those are from Portugal. Hmm. So they're the big producer. They have big areas of cork oak forests, just like we have coast live oak forests. And actually, I can reach one, but <laughs> the leaves are very similar to the coast live oak and they do they do tend to tip down around the edge. So that there, mm -hmm. a lot of oaks don't look like that, but, and certainly the Eastern oaks don't, but here's two plants, one from Mediterranean, one from California. They're both oaks, but they've definitely had the same adaptation. But we don't have any adaptation like this on our coast live oaks. This of course is an adaptation to protect against fire because if, and the hills that it grows on in Portugal look a lot like our hills right around here. And if a fire is burning through in the grasses and the shrubs and it burns through fast, it'll never get through all of this. So this tree will conserve. That doesn't mean that our coast live oaks don't have an adaptation to fire because they do the same thing. They have a burl at the base and that is a thing that can re-sprout. So you can burn the whole tree down and it'll re-sprout at the base and grow back again. So they both have adapted to fire. Mm -hmm. um, it's an interesting thing. Um, Chile is the only Mediterranean climate that has let, it just doesn't compare in number of fires to Australia or Mediterranean Basin or California. Um, they think it's because there's less lightning mm. in Chile. That was one theory I read and I was thinking, well, yeah, this year we did have a lot of lightning fires, but over the last few years, mostly the fires have been set by man. Oh, certainly. <laughs> and so it's probably not as big a difference as it used to be. Because, um, have you guys ever thought about taking a chunk of bark off of that just to kind of show that process? Or is that... I don't think any of us feel like we know how to do yeah, it yeah. and not kill our trees. Yeah, it'd be a bummer so, to kill it. Now, so th th That's an interesting thing though. The cork oak in California, and there are cork oaks growing all over in California, produce good cork. There's nothing wrong with the cork. The only time that it was actually used was at the beginning of the Second World War. Um, they could not get cork, which was used in life preservers hmm. that the Navy used, because they couldn't get across from Europe because of German submarines. Hmm. So they stripped the cork oaks in California the man that was on a tour in, from San Diego told me they took all the cork oaks down there. Um, Dr. Howard Brown, who was head of horticulture and other things at Cal Poly, told me they, they did it at Cal Poly. And I talked to Warren Roberts, who ran the Arboretum at UC Davis till he retired, and asked him and he's, about the quad, because I went to UC Davis and there were cork oaks all the way around the quad, which was the center of the campus. Hmm. And he said they didn't touch those but all the rest of the cork oaks, they took all the cork off of it hmm. so they could make life preservers. That's cool. So it worked. Yeah. And those were all brought from Portugal? <laughs> well, they were all brought from the, well, Mediterranean. initially they were brought, but then they've been propagated in California oh, okay. for years. Um, you know, I think it's Monterey or Palm, but there's all, where the library is in San Luis. Oh, there's some down there? They're on the street there. Oh, I didn't know cork that. Or, cork oaks. Ah. So cork oaks have been grown in California, probably not right after the missions, but pretty soon. Soon after. Ah, oh, I didn't know those were down there. Yeah.
We okay. talked about man-made adaptations. And we can look here at all these plants here. There's one over there, dark purple almost. There's one here, variegated leaves, then red at the tips. Those are not flowers, those are the leaves. Little green leaves. Over the, here, this one has a cultivar named Inca Gold. And it's when it gets really good, the, the top ones will be real gold. These are all the same plant. Oh, uh, really? A couple of them, or maybe half of them, are hybrids of two plants. But it's Leucodendron solignum is the main thing. And then some of them are Leucodendron solignum with, I can't think of the other species. Oh, I can just stick it over here. Laurel, 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 It'd be like a leaf of laurel, I think. Okay. But anyway, but basically they're the same plant and they've all been created by man by selection where one of them had a little more pink and they just kept picking it selecting our gold or littler leaves or bigger leaves um, so that there's all these different leucodendrons years ago there was just the one or two species in the horticulture trade now they're all they've become one of the ornamental type of shrubs that you see all around and they do well in California so I, I don't know much about botany but uh, is there a lot of debate about whether you can actually create a new species just by crossbreeding different species? Well, there are, over a long period of time, after something has hybridized and gone on, mm -hmm. it will get a species name. It will, But it okay. takes, I think, more than a human lifetime. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So they've been, this, they've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, they've been doing this for a long time, and the only way, though, that they could produce it and have it the same, if, if they're satisfied with this, is with cuttings. Okay. Because if they go to seeds, they uh, can't predict what parts of which species would come out. So they're, 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 the cultivars are produced uh, by using um, okay. cuttings. So, so you have the same plant. Clones, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So this is the milkweed that is native to our area and this is the one that should be grown for monarchs. This is the narrow-leafed uh, milkweed and you can see the seeds coming out but I don't see any caterpillars. No, I don't see any caterpillars but what I do see is this beetle and often there's little orange aphids and I think the beetles may eat the aphids, I'm not sure. Okay. But they're always on. They don't seem to hurt the plant even when they aphids. But um, but this is the one that if you want to grow it, because it dies back and um, in the fall. And that's what it's doing right now. It doesn't continue to live so that the butterflies could keep feeding on it. Whereas the uh. Mexican one lasts and then the butterflies tend to not migrate plus a parasite that can develop on it has years to develop and produce numbers that will actually affect the caterpillar and you can't in the caterpillar after eating them can't uh, develop into a butterfly no kidding yeah Jessica Griffith speaks on that and, huh. and, and we better speak here and she's she's that's it so that the Mexican one if you cut it off in the fall so it isn't there that's that's all right huh interesting and so these are all plants that you're going to sell in here ken these are and they go up into this next shade house um, when they're all in gallon cans and that's where we have our plant sales which we can't have right now but uh, we actually have online sales that people can buy them and pick them up. Okay, this property going like this is all part of the 150 acres that we have within the park for the botanical garden. So if we see the Eagle Rock, which is not in the garden, it's be beyond it. But just below that is the top of our property. And then if we look under these eucalyptuses, you'll see another row of eucalyptuses just before the National Guard over 
over there. That's where our property goes to. So that's our big property. We've got a lot of growth space. There's on this hill and the next one, there are 90 Chilean wine palms. It's probably the largest grove of wine palms outside of Chile that isn't a, a nursery or something like that. Um, those, those are, they're not, um, what's the word, uh, most, in they're not endangered, but they're right below that in, in having problems um, uh, in Chile because they're in one national park and another small one, and then commercially they're planted, but they're, when they're commercially planted, they're to get sap that they make sugar out of, and they cut the top off and that kills the plant and then they mm. gather all the sap. And they make wine out of that then? They can ferment it and make okay. alcohol. Okay. So that's where the Chilean wine palm Hi. Uh, name comes from. But um, the, uh, but sugar, the, the sugar they use in, in Chile, a lot of it, it comes from these palms. Oh, interesting. And do those get tall, Ken? Do they get... Yes. They're not... They're not, I think they get up to about 45 feet. Oh, wow. They're not real, as tall as a lot of palms. They're the biggest around at the base of any palm. Mm. Yeah, they get really thick and big. So right. when they're about, let's see, these were planted in 08 through 011. So we've got, they're more than 10 years old. When they get about 35 years, then they have the fruit yeah. and the flowers. The flowers is stems is where they get the syrup but actually the nuts are really good they taste uh, like coconut oh cool and about five of those come from the royal grandy because there was one in front of the old catholic church on branch street and my wife and i we used to go over and pick them up and and take the nuts home because nobody it was in a parking lot and nobody picked them up huh. and they were good and uh, so when then we when we got involved with the garden we grew some five but jan von engel who also built this shade house did the other 85 and they're all from one Chilean wine palm in King City okay that's pretty cool and how big are the nuts they're about like a macadamia nut oh, okay. a little bigger um, they're not as hard to crack <laughs> okay we've got two trees here um, that we can talk about. One is the California Buckeye. And you can see here we are, we're in September, and there's just very few little leaves that didn't quite fall off. And there's some of the Buckeyes, um, the seeds, that when you peel off that husk, there's a dark brown, shiny nut that looks like a deer's eye. And so that's where it gets its name, Buckeye. And there's different Buckeyes back east than this one. Ours don't get as big as the eastern ones. There's European Buckeyes. Um, but the ones in California are summer deciduous. Now that is another Mediterranean climate ad adaptation. We've got plenty of sun all year long. So by losing their leaves when it's hottest, and I think this last, I haven't been here since we've had our real hot spell, uh, there were still some leaves on it, but they, they dropped. Um, it, by losing the leaves in the summer when it's hottest, they're saving water. And they live in the foothills, and um, they're not going to get much water until the winter, so they don't. As soon as it's been raining, the leaves start sprouting, and the flowers come out, and then the nuts form, and then as soon as it hits the summer, um, and more in the hills in here because we do irrigate some, uh, all the leaves drop. So now that's summer deciduous. Now we've got an oak. It's beautiful oak leaves. And this is a Mediterranean climate oak and it's from the Mediterranean basin um, on the coast where Yugoslavia, well, Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, Bosnia, that whole area and back into the um, into that peninsula. Uh, comes, this one comes from there. This is a, an oak that would really be more uh, comparable to some of the eastern oaks because it's winter deciduous. It loses all its leaves um, in 
in the winter and <clears throat> uh, keeps them. So it, although it's a Mediterranean climate plant, uh, it, it hasn't used that adaptation. So we've got those two trees right here. Uh, I think this is the first year <laughs> that we've got acorns. Little tiny ones, but... Wow. They, uh, like they, ever? I, that, we may have had some before, but there's a lot on it now, and I've always looked. Huh. And so I could have missed some somewhere, maybe higher, but huh. this, is, this is really the first time. Interesting. One thing we didn't mention, we talked about light colored leaves, <clears throat> but olive colored or bluish or light colored leaves is definitely a Mediterranean climate adaptation. And this is a good example. And this is the kind of thing that when you, that makes it similar. If you go to Italy or you go to Chile and you look at the hills, there's something about them. They look alike to us in California because there's a lot of these shrubby plants we call it chaparral, they call it madaral or garig in different places, but it's the same kind of a plant mm. growth. Shrubby, small leaves, often bluish gray, and, uh, which reflects light, and so they don't get as hot. <clears throat> okay, this is um, all different South African or Cape Province, um, Western Cape Province aloes from South Africa. The one over there is probably from eastern South Africa. It's Marlothii, or at least a hybrid of that, and that doesn't really grow in the Mediterranean climate. However, it's gotten there, and none of us are willing to try, go in there and try and remove it. <laughs> so it survives. Huh. But most of these, um, and they're nice because they bloom in the winter. So in December and January and February, the aloes are all blooming, and it, that's kind of a nice type of plant to have in your garden. Um, these right here, not this one, this is called a tilt-held aloe, allo and it's one of the only ones that the flowers aren't orange or red or yellow. They're kind of aqua colored and then they turn yellow, but they're, and it's called a tilt-head because it always bends one way. But these aloe ferox are one aloe that produces a material that's like aloe vera, and that can be used like aloe vera. Aloe vera is a North African aloe, it comes from Morocco and up in that area. It's Mediterranean, but it is not South African, so we have one over in the succulent bed. But these um, produce aloe ferox, and now a lot of times on the aloe vera bottles, if you read them, it'll sit, one of the contents will be aloe ferox hmm. because they're much bigger, they grow all over the hills in South Africa, so they've become commercially important that hmm. way. But they have a lot of, of um, nectar in the flowers, which runs down and held in the leaves. And it's said that that ferments, and then the baboons like to eat and drink that. Hmm. I mean, do they get drunk they off of it? They get a little drunk, yeah. <laughs> watch this plant. This is a Chilean bromeliad. There's a lot of what are called terrestrial bromeliads in Chile. In other words, they're not growing as air plants up in the trees. They're growing in the ground. And when this one blooms, it's spectacular. Hmm. It has a aqua blue and gold flowers. It's a big stem and they're a bright, shiny hmm. green blue with bright yellow anthers and, and coloring them. So it, it bloomed last year. It went a couple of years without blooming, and then uh, it bloomed. How big is the flower? It's a big stalk. One big stalk. Yeah. How like yeah. come yeah, up? Yeah, up like that. Wow. Yeah. Like a yucca. Oh, okay. So it takes maybe a, a year or two to build up the energy to do it again. I don't know, or it just we, we don't have perfect conditions. Oh, okay. We're going to be trying. We're developing five kiosks up on the hill with a trail. And each kiosk will be one of the five. It'll be in the areas. And we're going to be using some different puyas around them. Oh, cool. Just to see how they do up there. 
we're going to spend a little time here in our fire safe demonstration garden. Now there's no home built that's totally fire safe, but you can certainly make them safer and this is to demonstrate those things. And I will mention that the first thing you may notice is that there's two oak trees here. You definitely would not plant two oak trees <laughs> this close to the house if this is our house. So, but they were there already and hopefully at some point we'll prune one the way if you had an oak tree on your property away from the house, you would prune it and then leave the other one just to show unpruned. But there are certain things that you can do. And the first is to have this 30 feet of defensible space um, that's really specific. And you can see the line here, 30 feet, and um, there, um, there are some plants back there, and they're called campfire, there's not too many of them, that are red, so that kind of leaves. And it goes all the way around our building. What you're going to plant in that first 30 feet is mostly succulents. All succulents would be just fine because they are storing water. We talked about that, and they don't burn very fast. They don't. It takes a long time before they would catch on fire. One thing you would not have is wood mulch like we have. We are able to make our own mulch, and it saves us on water and weeds, so we use it. But we have gravel all the way around, at least three feet away, around this. If this was our home. Um, but you really shouldn't have it close because it can blow up against the house. If an ember lands under there, they may have put out a fire all around you. That might sit for two weeks and then flare up and start burning your house. So you really don't want that kind of thing. Then the next 70 feet up to 100 feet, you plant in islands um, so that plants are separated and you keep down the native grasses or whatever would be there in there. So um, there's these three things and I'm going to go. You want them lean, so that's minimal or no flammable vegetation within the 30 feet. Clean, no accumulation of dead vegetation or <laughs> inflammable material like this mulch. Unless you could use rock mulch, there'd be nothing wrong with using rock mulch. And then green. The plants need to be irrigated within that area. Above the 100 feet, we're not doing anything about irrigation. We're putting na California natives, not just Mediterranean climate, which we have around here. But beyond that, we're calling it just the way it would be if you were built in the hills and you weren't going to do anything beyond. They're going to become so the lean and the green and the clean are the main things. And of course, how a home is roofed, uh, an awful lot of things can be done for a home itself. You don't want trees. I ha have a cousin's daughter who was in the Agoura Hills fire and her house half burned, but um, the, the man, one of the firemen said to her, I see you had a palm tree right up against the house, but you'd cut it down. And she said, yeah, we did. He said, if you hadn't, you wouldn't have a house at all now. Oh, wow. Because the fronds, he said, would have dropped on the roof. Uh, and that would have been it. Huh. All right. Next is our building. And we're talking about green building, green construction. Um, and this is that kind of a building. Uh, I'm going to read you some definitions what things are just because I, uh, without it I can't really remember, remember it all. So one thing is what is a green building? They blend with their ecosystems. They conserve energy. You use materials that minimize energy requirements. You increase water and energy conservation and you use sustainable which means renewable resources. Now, the people that measure that is it's an organization, the Green Building Council, and they've developed a thing called LEED, L-E-E-D, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Our building was built as bronze, silver, gold, and platinum. We were we built to golden, golden standards, but we've never had it actually verified because that costs money, but we did build to the gold standards, and that's what we have there. So LEED has five areas of concern. The site development, 
water conservation, energy efficiency, material selection, and indoor environmental quality. And we'll talk about those things as we go through the building. Um, as far as site development, we can just talk about that we're standing here. This building is facing south. We're able to use the sun to heat it. And we'll talk about different ways that we use that. It's also on the road. Uh, so we already had a road here. We thought we were able to connect into the sewer system, but that's another story. And we'll talk about our wastewater treatment plant here. Uh, so we thought we had that, but we did have electricity and gas coming up here. So we weren't going into a site that we had considered uh, where all of that would have to be developed. So that, that's part of making a, a green building. Green architecture is the practice of increasing the efficiency with which buildings use resources, energy, water, materials, while reducing buildings' impacts on human health and the environment during the building's lifetime. So let's start here with water, because um, what kind of, how are we saving water? Well, one thing you can see is we've got a big tank, I think it's 5,000 gallons. We've got three of those. Uh, there may be one over there, isn't as big. It's where we're catching water off the roofs. And we're still gonna be putting in more because we're not catching, we're only catching I think, two of the roofs right now. So that water is then able to be pumped up into areas to, to irrigate them. That's one. Another is that all the water that comes down here, we have a swale at the bottom of our property, right by the road. That swale, the water goes into it and it starts down. And wherever there's a little road coming up off, we have a culvert that's raised. So the water can't go through that. It's like a dam until it gets to a certain level and that lets it settle into the earth. So we're replenishing our water basin. So that's one thing. And then the third is our wastewater treatment plant. We thought we could connect into the sewers that are in the park. And we found out, no, the county said, no, you have to produce your, protect, do your own thing. And this is a system that had been developed for a lot of places where septic tanks didn't work well, it was very rocky, and um, they, they needed homes, big homes needed their own wastewater treatment plants. And uh, this one, of course, is large and can handle a lot more water than we put in. But what we've got here is all the water out of the building, whether it's the sinks or the toilets or the kitchen, comes down and right in here, we have a 15,000 gallon tank. Everything goes in there and that's basically a settling tank. The materials settles in the water and in that there's bacteria and everything in it digesting. From there, it could go to any of three other things. The next thing it can go into is what's called an Advantax textile filtration. There's two, the two long uh, covers there. In there, there's a 45 square foot area with layers of a material that's kind of like Dacron. Again, this catches bacteria grow on that, break it down further. From there, it goes to a big sand filtration area down further. Or it can go in to this subsurface vegetative area, which I don't think much has been going in there because not much plants are growing, so there isn't a lot of water. But there is some. These are being uh, having the water come in. And the roots, again, act as a filtration. So the big tank plus any two of these other three produce tertiary water, which means you can use it for irrigation or industrial uses. It then is all pumped across into the park and from beyond where that eucalyptus tree all the way to the creek and over to the parking lot are about 18 inches deep are tubes with uh, where water can leak out of and it gives them a little water. There's one area between this eucalyptus and the pepper trees that is a little greener when I look out there and that's probably where most of that water goes but we don't produce very much but it does it is fine to use for irrigation so we're certainly not wasting water here and that's all part of having a green building 
Very cool. Now, before we go in, and we'll later, we'll show you this on the other building, but those are not windows that are under each office window. Those are called a trom wall or a heat sink. They're stainless, uh, stainless steel tanks with glass on this side, full of water. So, in the winter, when the sun is low, the sun hits those things and heats the water, and that acts as a radiator during the night to keep the building warm. In the summer, when the sun is high, this shades that. But actually, even with that, sometimes those rooms get a little warm. Mm -hmm. But they, but it does work. Um, we have one little electric heater here in the hall, and then we have one propane heater in the big building, and we'll see that. And are, they're almost never used. Mm -hmm. And we have no cooling other than fans. Here's again, we'll see this from the inside. Again, this is a trial wall right here that works for this room. And is it is it painted black too, Ken? Is no, it, it isn't. No, okay. No, it's just clear glass. It's just clear. But it's the way it works. Now, why are these sticking out here? Well, this is plaster around rice straw bales. So where we, whenever you see a wall like this, we know there's a bale of rice stacked up in here. And here's the way it looks in this wall. It has the wire to hold it together and they're just bales that have been stacked up. And so they call this the truth wall, mm. correct? Yes, to show what's inside. Well, this is our big meeting room. We can look at a lot of things here that have to do with um, green building. Let's, this is that steel tank that's full of water. So that's what radiates heat into here. Now, if we wanted to cool this, which I wish we have, we can turn on these fans and we can open the windows way up at the top that will get the air to go up. And the time you do that is that if, you, if we have a warm day like this and we want that to be cooled off next day, do that at night. When the air is cooler, it'll suck cool air in and, and out. And um, so that is it. The only heater is that, but we have no cooling. But if we open the windows and turn on these fans, it, it would cool off. So as far as electricity, we're not using much, and we do have solar panels, so that's the other thing. We're producing our own electricity, and we produce way more than we use. Okay, one of the big things about green building is to use and reuse materials. Um, and of course, you, to do that, you have to find something that's being used as waste, then you have to find out what you can make out of it that can be used, and then you have to be able to sell that <laughs> to make it worthwhile. So let's start talking about it. These tiles are at least 50% of material that has not been um, fired, but it's waste material in ceramic production. So they just sweep it all up, I think, and use it again to make these tiles. Um, if we're looking around, let's, oh, let's talk about the soffits here. And when we go in the other room, you'll see that the, there's some doors and everything. This is Douglas fir that is that color because it was used for years in cherry grinding tanks in Oregon. Um, <clears throat> I have a son-in-law who does a lot of woodwork, and he said he's never seen Douglas fir that was better looking the grain and everything than this. So it, it was a long time ago that they were built into these cherry brining things. So what's cherry brining? Well, back in the 1800s, they planted a lot of cherries in Oregon in hopes of being able to ship them back east, but they never made it. It was just, transportation was too slow and they were always rotten by the time they got there. So a professor at Oregon State came up with the idea of brining the cherries and making imitation maraschino cherries out of them. And so all the maraschino cherries we get are really not 
Maraschino cherries are a species of cherry that grows in Croatia and that area, Mediterranean climate. But, um, and then they put them in uh, syrup, uh, and then they can be used in drinks or whatever. But he created this process. So there are huge, um, big tanks. And a couple of years ago, I got to see them. Uh, and they're between, I was on a bus to her, but looking out, they pointed them out. They were between the Dolls and Portland, Oregon, in an area where there's a lot of cherries mm -hmm. being grown. So they, they would soak the cherries in that. Well, obviously, the wood started taking up the color. And our contractor, who was a Cuesta professor teaching um, green construction, had found that wood and um, he just loved it. And he refinished, he cut it and fixed it. And so we've used it, but it's really beautiful. Um, let's go over here. These counters here are made from sawdust and the waste paper from the school district. I'm um, pretty sure it's in Tacoma, Washington. And then mixed with a, a glue or a hardening thing. So they're really good. You can't put something real hot on them, but they've been here now. Our building from say 07 on. So that's 13 years. And they really, and they've had all kinds of, we have potlucks and people put everything on here and different programs have been snakes and birds and everything. <laughs> and it looks very good. So that, that was reusing sawdust and paper, waste paper. Um, now let's look at these. This is maple veneer. And there's an organization um, that produces what's called F or certifies what's called FSC, which is um, <laughs> For, forestry Stu Stewardship Stu Council. Stu Forest Stewardship Council. Yeah. yeah. Forestry Stewardship Council. I had that memorized before I came. <laughs> I never, and I, as soon as I go to see it, I can't see it. Anyway, so what that means is this maple can be replaced in 10 years. Mm. So if they can harvest the same amount of maple every 10 years, then that qualifies. Our big beams are that kind of wood, too, not maple, but are also FSC wood. So those are all kinds of things that go into um, making it a green building. The other thing is that uh, is the fact, and today is not a good example, that the building is really pretty much self-heating and cooling. Um, the, the windows on this side let the heat in. The windows on the other side prevent the heat from going out. They've got surfaces that allow that. So let's go in the kitchen. And the light is really good in here too, right? I mean, yes. And this is no lights. We don't need to turn on the lights and we're going here. Another truth wall here. Oh, we got lots of room. And we don't even have a class. All right. Okay, well, you can see in here how um, light it is. During the day, you just don't need to turn on lights. We can do it. This is our kitchen. It's a commercial kitchen. It was originally a catering kitchen, but we found that, for example, when we had a summer camp, we couldn't produce snacks for the kids in here. It had to be a commercial kitchen, and a woman made a donation, and we were able to change to the three kind of sink and the bright dishwasher and everything. But again, the tile, the wood, all of those things are where they re reuse materials. One that isn't, I don't always talk about it, is this marble. Marble is definitely not a green material. Uh, our marble apparently all comes from China now, so it means shipping it all the way across the Pacific which is a lot of energy, it's heavy. And the only reason we used it was, was a donation, and it didn't cost anything, and it made a very good surface. And he said he was going to be throwing it in the dump if we didn't use it, because there was not enough of it to use in any 
construction job. So again, we've got the light windows and the skylight and materials that have been are considered green materials. Yes. Okay. Really, that's that brings up a subject I didn't really go into well at all, and that's thermal mass. Okay. What is thermal mass? Well, it's anything that can hold a temperature so that it's steadier. The best source, the biggest thermal mass is our ocean. That's what makes our temperate climate because it's so big, it doesn't vary much in temperature. The sun, I mean, we've had this hot spell and probably the temperature in the ocean is still 55 or 56 degrees. It just, and that really helps uh, for Mediterranean climates. But we can add to that. This plaster is two to two and a half inches thick all around the straw bale. The straw bale does not have any thermal mass, but it does have um, good uh, resistance to fire. It's about like R35 or something. So it's, rice straw has a lot of silicone in it, and that's the problem. They can't um, bury it. They can't dig it in because it doesn't decompose in the rice fields. So they always had to burn it. And they would burn it in the Sacramento Valley and the sky would be black. And they've been, they, over the years, they've cut down on the amount they can burn. And I think now it's not, they can't burn any. So that is a, a product that was going into the waste and we can be use it in construction and acts as insulation. And uh, that, so that is helping maintain our temperatures. But the two and a half inches of plaster does have thermal mass. And we've got nine inches of concrete underneath. Now, concrete has thermal mass, so that's great. It also, though, it has pretty high energy requirements to produce it, because you have to burn limestone and so. But you can replace up to 50% of that limestone with Coal, yeah, it's fire, it's... I think it's coal-fired power plants. Yeah, yeah, from the power plants, they have the, the um, it's called like coal ash, but anyway, it's a pro the byproduct, which is what, again, went into waste. You can replace half the Portland cement with that, and it still makes good concrete, and that's what we've done here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. So, we've got a lot of thermal mass, that helps the room stay the same temperature all the time. Let's go up. And of course, the trom wall would be another thermal mass. Yeah, in the water there. And all of this plaster around the building is two to two and a half inches thick. Okay, well this is our library, and it's just another example of um, some things that were used. These shelves, these library shelves, have the coatings have no volatile organic compounds in them. The paint that we use in the building also had no volatile organic compounds. When we moved into the building, there was no paint smell, there was no chemical smell at all. Um, so this company makes that, they, they use, I think they do use some materials over again. Uh, the tile is again the same. And then we've got our Douglas fir that looks so nice. There's the only heating in this area here. Huh. And that's hardly ever, and it's certainly not on now. <laughs> <laughs> but also there's no AC. No. No air conditioning. No air conditioning yeah. at all. Just the fans. And yeah, and you could really feel us. That's, yes. that's all you need. Yeah, we've got the windows open and the fan. It's so much better in here than in the other room. Yes. Because <laughs> yeah. that's been closed up. Yeah, and because nobody's been over there. Nobody's Nobody. tried them yeah. monitoring yeah. the temperature. Yeah. So they're not worrying. So I think that um, pretty much covers it. You got some questions? That there. was it. See what we didn't talk about.